Good evening, everybody, and you're very welcome to UCD's Institute of Food and Health, our public lecture series. So these lecture series are designed to give you, the public, expert knowledge in the area of food and health that is of public interest. Tonight we have the important topic of food waste, and I'm delighted to introduce our two experts in the field. The first up will be Dr. Nigel Brunton, and Nigel is an Associate Professor of Food Science at the School of Agriculture and Food at University College Dublin. And Nigel specialises in the area of phytochemicals and their recovery from food waste. So these are chemicals that typically have very good health benefits. He works with a range of companies, so there's very much an applied aspect to his research. And these are companies interested in adding value to food waste and developing technologies to recover food ingredients to get valuable recovered products. Then the second half of the talk will be presented by Dr. Sarah Brown. And Sarah is a registered dietitian and she's an assistant professor in clinical nutrition and dietetics in UCD. Sarah began her working uh, career as a community dietitian with the HSC and there she worked on a range of primary care services, including weight management, diabetes, heart health and malnutrition. And indeed, Sarah also worked in private practice as well, where she spe specialised in youth programmes and education. And now Sarah's research focuses on food sustainability and the factors with nutrition and dietary quality are the main elements of her research currently at UCD. So the talk is designed for you, the public, so it's important that you have an opportunity to ask questions and answers. So if you could place your answer, questions and answers in the tab, then my colleague, Professor Lorraine Brennan, will moderate the questions and we'll do our best for Nigel and for Sarah to answer as many as we can uh, in the time that we have allotted here this evening. So I'm delighted you can all join us and over to you now, Nigel. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dolores, and uh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction. So the title of my uh, talk is uh, Food Waste and the Circular Bioeconomy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the whole problem of food waste, and then I'm going to look into um, uh, two ways in which we're trying to uh, address the problem of, of food waste uh, within the Institute of, of, of Food and Health. Uh, one that I'm directly involved with, with uh, myself and another uh, a colleague of mine has, has worked on. So let's just um, have a look at what the problem is to begin with. So um, in the European Union, uh, 59 million tonnes of food waste uh, is generated um, annually. Um, and that's uh, the way in which we um, measure food waste can vary. Um, so uh, some... Um, some websites or some some statistical um, agencies will tell us that it's ten percent. Some say twenty percent. So so it's somewhere between ten and twenty percent of uh, the food made made available to you consumers uh, can be uh, wasted. And then producing and transporting uh, that, that 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 food waste and and its decomposition um, is a, a huge uh, contributor to uh, global greenhouse gases. Um, so eight, eight to ten percent of global greenhouse gases can ar uh, arise from um, from food directly from from food waste. So apart from the fact that um, the, in a lot of areas in the in the world uh, uh, people are going hungry, it's also contributing towards uh, greenhouse gas gases. Um, and in fact, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of of greenhouse gases. And where is it coming from? So it's coming from um, production. So that's for the primary production of, of the food waste. So that's uh, animals on farms and crops, et cetera. Um, it's also coming from processing. So that's transforming the food into, into something else during the distribution and the marketing of the food, that the food can be wasted. But by far the, the largest portion comes from consumption. So that's at the point of the consumer where the consumer um, uh, is uh, either consuming it at home or in in a restaurant or, or another catering facility. So, um, this is by far the the largest um place from which uh, food waste can can arise. 
So what's the solution? How can we combat this, this um, ever increasing problem of, of food waste? Well, the mantra really um, that's, that's often used is reduce, reuse, repurpose and recycle. So first thing we need to concentrate on is, is um, reducing the amount of waste that, that we produce. Um, we will also have to focus on reusing um, the waste, um, uh, reusing uh, the raw materials that, were, that, that, are, that are being wasted as much as possible. We can also repurpose them for other functions. And, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, later on. And of course, then can all also be recycled. But unfortunately, at the moment, we have what's known as a linear economy, whereby raw materials are used for the manufacture of products, which are then distributed and used, and then waste arises from, from, uh, from this. And um, use of the waste is not fo focused on. And we need to um, develop what's known as a, a circular bioeconomy, in which at all steps in the, um, in the use of, of food that we focus on generating as little waste as possible. And when um, waste has been generated unavoidably, uh, we need to find uh, other uses uh, for, for this waste um, that can help solve the, the problem of food waste. And I'm going to show you uh, two possible ways in which um, uh, food waste uh, can be used. Um, so uh, I took this particular graphic from the, the EPA website just to show you um, at what points during the during the um, uh, the the way in which we can reduce food waste that I'm going to be focused on. So here we have a food waste hierarchy. And the, the most important thing is prevent it at source. We to use it to, to feed people. We can also use the, the food waste to feed livestock. Uh, what I'm going to look at a little bit is uh, what, uh, the pro a process known as uh, biorefining, which uh, you can see is just opposite the, the blue arrow there, um, which is a, a process by which we take uh, food waste that cannot be um, uh, reused with, uh, for, for human consumption, and we try to recover uh, um, uh, compounds or chemicals, or as Dolores referred to them, phytochemicals uh, for use. Um, in foods um, to help it make it healthier or also to, to, to um, uh, preserve its, its, uh, its shelf life. I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the, the second last part of the triangle there, which is anaerobic digestion. Um, and this is a process by which we can produ um, produce biogas from food waste, and that biogas can then contrib contribute to, um, uh, to energy production or, or for use as um, a fuel for cars, etc. So um, here's an, a representation of the anaerobic digestion process. Anaerobic digestion takes place in the absence of air, in the absence of oxygen. So um, what happens is specialized uh, bacteria uh, can break down um, the, what will be known as the feedstock. So that feedstock can be uh, animal manure. Um, in some countries, especially in Germany, they, they grow um, Perhaps specifically for uh, anaerobic digestion, but also, of course, and, and that, that um, this is the focus for today. Food waste itself can be used in an anaerobic digester. And what happens in the anaerobic digester? Digester is that, uh, as I said, specialized bacteria will utilize the, the nutrients that are left in in, in the food waste, uh, resulting in the production of um, of biogas. And biogas is a uh, mostly methane, so about six. 60% methane, and the, the rest is mostly carbon dioxide. And that biogas can then be used as transportation fuel. Uh, fuel. It can be can used for the, for the production of energy that can go on to um, the, the electrical grid um, and also can be used uh, for, for heat production. Um, and the whole concept of a circular bioeconomy means that we, we try to use every, uh, every uh, usable part of um, of the raw material that we're focusing on. So even what's left over after the anaerobic digestion can be used uh, as a biofertilizer on land. Um, so this is a good illustration of trying to make as much of a use of um, uh, raw material that we get from nature as possible. I just wanted to focus a little bit on a, a specific uh, a 
part of, of, of the solution that, that we've looked at here in the Institute of, of Food and Health. And um, there are particular uh, technologies that can help us with the process of um, production of biogas. They can increase the yield of biogas from a particular uh, raw material. So the example I'm given here is on, of, of spent mushroom compost. So this is what's left over after we grow, grow mushrooms. And that can be a use, used as a feedstock for, for bio, biomass production. However, um, what needs to happen for the production of biogas to, to, to take place is that the, the nutrients that are contained within the, um, the spent mushroom compost um, have to be utilized by the bacteria to help them grow and produce the biogas. Um, well, we have specialized technologies that help release those uh, nutrients. So in this case, it's a technology known as pulsed electric field. And what it can do is it can break the walls of cells and therefore release the nutrients. And now, and because the nutrients are, are now more available, um, the bacteria can grow better and produce more biogas. Um, so you can see that illustrated at the bottom of the slide here. This, this is what a process known as lysis or the breaking of the cells. You've got the formation of pores and the, and the, the, the release of the nutrients contained within, within the cell. And um, a colleague of mine, Dr. AJ Men, has, has looked at this technology and um, he has found that um, you can markedly increase the amount of biogas that, that, that can be produced uh, from spent mushroom compost by pre-treating it using pulse electric field. So you, you pre-treat what, as I said, what's known as the feedstock, and that uh, allows the bacteria to grow um, better, and therefore you get a higher yield of biogas. And the, the strength of the, the pulse electric field, so the amount of energy you put in um, results in a, a, a greater yield. So what you can see on this graph is you're going from a blank in which there's no um, pulse electric field treatments to a weak, a medium and a strong field. And each time you increase the strength of the field, you get more uh, biogas. So um, one of the things a lot of people in, in, in the whole area of the circle bioeconomy are, are looking at is always to increase the efficiency of, of, of the process as much as possible. And some of these uh, newly available technologies, such as pulse electric fields, can help um, make the process more efficient. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, an area of, of research that I um, have directly worked on myself, which is the recovery of um, phytochemicals or uh, useful molecules from, uh, from what would have been regarded up to now as, as food waste. But um, I like to think of it rather as a rest raw material. So it's a raw material um, that's been generated as part of a, a food production process, uh, uh, but it contains valuable um, ingredients, valuable, valu valuable components. And some of the things that I've worked on are, are things like apple pomace, potato peel, mushroom stalks, brewer's spent grain. So brewer's spent grain is the, what's left over um, from the... Uh, the process of, of producing uh, beers and lagers, etc. Apple pomace is something that, that arises from um, the um, cider production industry in, in Ireland. So that's what's left over um, after the, the cider has been produced. I've also used worked on underutilized plants. So these are, are plants that grow in abundance, in, uh, especially in Ireland. And they also contain some very um, important molecules. And I've also worked with seaweeds um, and, you know, um, Seaweeds also contain uh, a lot of um, uh, very useful molecules um, that can be used in other, in other foods. So just, I, I don't want to blind you with science in, on the next slide. I just wanted to mention the kind of molecules that I've worked on, on before. So the hidden molecules in these substrates are things like polyphenols. So polyphenols are a type of antioxidant. So antioxidants can um, um, have health promoting effects but they can also be used to help preserve foods. Um, so um, uh, specifically, fluorotannins are the type of antioxidants that you will find in seaweeds. And I've worked on um, looking at methods of trying to extract them from, from, from seaweeds for use in other foods. I've also worked on a group of compounds known as glycoalkaloids. And uh, these are compounds that are particularly rich in uh, potato peels. And as you might imagine, we have a, a large... Um, 
uh, potato industry in Ireland and we produce a lot of um, um, chips and crisps and that generates a lot of potato peel which was which was uh, um, being dumped however um, it's well known the potato peel ca contains uh, large amounts or uh, uh, well um, harvestable amounts of of these glycoalkaloids uh, two examples are given here alpha uh, selenine and alpha jaconine um, these can't be used as a food ingredient these can actually be used as a a pharmaceutical because they have anti-cancer pro properties. Uh, another um, compound that I've worked on uh, are, are, are beta-glucans and beta-glucans are a type of carbohydrate um, and they have the, the ability to, to reduce cholesterol and they can be used then as a food ingredient. And the particular uh, source that I've looked at for, for beta-glucans is Brewer's Brent Grain. Um, I just wanted to talk then also about a project that I that I was inv I've been involved with, um, uh, known as Agrimax. It's a it's a big uh, EU um, a funded project, and the reason I wanted to mention it really is to uh, try and get the go across the con concept that if we are to solve the problem of food food waste, um, it's a big problem, and we need lots of people involved. For example, this Agrimax uh, project had twenty nine partners involved in it. It was funded to the value of 15 million um, and um, there was lots of different partners involved and lots of different expertise involved in, 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 this, in this project. And it, it would be only one of, of many projects of this nature that are being funded by the European Union uh, because of the recognition of um, the importance of solving uh, this huge problem of the generation of food waste. Um, and up to the before I um, worked on uh, Agrimax, a lot of the work that I uh, had done was was really at the at the concept stage, uh, at the concept uh, phase. So at, at the bench, I was looking at what's the uh, at a lab scale, what's the best way of recovering uh, particular compounds from from food waste. However, within the Agrimax uh, um, uh, project. I got the chance to upscale some of some of these met methods. So we worked with engineers on the Agrimax pro pro project to develop ways to uh, extract in, um, lots of different uh, uh, molecules from foods. And this, the example I've given here is polyphenol uh, extraction. Um, and uh, this is an example of the, the workflow involved in the extraction of, of polyphenols from um, I'm not sure if you can see the text up, up in the top uh, left-hand corner, uh, but it's from uh, uh, dried uh, uh, olive palms, so that's what's left left over um, when um, olives are, are crushed uh, for the production of, of olive oil uh, uh, and also from potato peel, which is a byproduct from the production of crisps and chips. And both of those contain um, uh, different types of polyphenols that could be used uh, as, as food ingredients, specifically um, in olive palms. There's a polyphenol called hydroxytyrosol, which um, uh, has um, good health promoting effects in, 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 in uh, uh, the protection against cholesterol oxidation specifically. Um, so this was the first time I really got to see my research upscaled. And uh, what happened as part of, of the project was is that a bio refinery, bio refineries were built in two places, uh, one in Spain and one in, one in Italy. And um, you can see uh, the number of people uh, from the picture involved in this project, but you can also see from the from the uh, pictures on this slide the the actual construction of the bio refinery taking place, and that bio refinery is still uh, in use, um, and it's been used to recover um, the compound I mentioned, hydroxytyrosol from from apple uh, from olive pomace, and it's also actually been used to to recover aroma volatiles from from fruit peels. And, and those aroma volatiles can then be used as a flavoring in, in other foods. Um, and then coming near the end of the talk, but one of the things I wanted to talk about is that, you know, we're still uh, researching this area. There's still a lot of work to, work to be done and there are, there are obstacles and challenges uh, left. Uh, for example, one of the things that um, uh, is always going to be a challenge is the homogeneity of the raw material. And by that, I mean, if I am trying to uh, extract a particular compound from a particular poo, uh, a food waste, and I'm going to try and produce a, a marketable food ingredient, the, the waste has to be uniform. It has to always have 
approximately the same amount of that of the compound that I'm trying to extract out of it. Um, and that's not always the case. You know, food is biological material, and it, and the levels of the compounds can, can can vary. So that's that's one of the the, the problems. The logistics is also a problem because if you're going to uh, what's known as valorize, so valorize is extracting the hidden value from the food. If you're going to do that, um, you really need really large amounts of the um, uh, of of the of the raw material for for the valorization to be commercial. So it actually you actually probably need some sort of uh, logistics plan to get it all into the one place. Another thing that's that um, uh, is a little bit of a challenge is that. In order to extract a food, uh, to extract a molecule for use in a food, you have to do so in a food friendly ma manner. So you have to use um, uh, solvents that, can, that 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 are not going to render the ingredient uh, toxic when you when you uh, extract it out. And they're not always the best um, solvents for getting the highest yield of a molecule out. Um, it's a valorization process, and it it itself will create a waste product, and we have to make sure. We have a use for the for the waste product that results from the from this pro this process, and one of the possible solutions uh, for that is the uh, the use of anaerobic di 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 digestion uh, that I mentioned, and then I suppose the um, technology readiness, the, the the ability of the people uh, within the food industry to to use some of the technologies that 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 I I've, I've talked about, um, they're they're not always there at this stage. There's still a bit a challenge to get that across to consumers. However, if we can do this we, successfully, we can develop new value chains for higher value products. We can open up new markets so we can connect organizations and sectors. We can improve environmental performance and cost efficiencies. And we can validate new products with a higher value than cur at current applications of the raw material and therefore facilitate um, rural development and employment. And of course, we're increasing sustainability and, and meeting a clear market de demand. And above and uh, 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 above all of that, of course, we are actually um, helping to create a circular bio, bio economy and finding use for for the waste for the waste uh, that the huge amount of waste that's being produced uh, in in the process of of food production. Okay, so um, that's my last slide, and and thanks very much for for your attention. Uh, there's my email address if you if you'd like to contact me, and I'd also last, like to thank Dr. AJ Menon for um, uh, giving me some of the of some of the slides for this pres presentation. Okay. Okay, so we're over to you now, Sarah, if you're ready to, to share your talk. Okay, thank you very much, Dolores. And thank you, Nigel. Um, I'm going to stick with the theme of seeing, viewing our food um, as a resource, but I am going to switch over to more of the consumer level um, and discuss food waste, nutrition and health um, and finish off by giving some tips around uh, food waste. Um, and thank you, Dolores, for the introduction. Um, so I suppose maybe just a technology that I am a dietitian and, and why are dietitians interested in food waste? And I suppose it is along that that theme. Um, it's around affordability of food. It's around making the best of the food that we have available to us and that we purchase um, and seeing food waste as one of, I suppose, three key pillars in food system sustainability, which we are concerned with as dietitians. Um, the other two being transitioning to more sustainable and healthy diets and the um, changes in food production and processing. Uh, so Nigel has already outlined that there's various uh, types of loss and waste along the food system. And today I'm just going to sort of focus on the final two here, wastage in the retail um, supermarket area but mainly wastage in the home and, and catering sector that we as as consumers or individuals are um have are, are most tangible or most in touch with so i suppose the question is how much influence does the individual have and i am cautious about 
placing all of the responsibility on on an individual or on the consumer um, because you'll see from Nigel's talk that food waste or food loss is a, a, an enormous global issue that the consumer certainly can't tackle in isolation but when we break down food waste so, so if we think about post-harvest post-production um, and we break that down we see that households in the food service sector have a huge role to play in terms of reducing the level of food waste um, so we do have some level of influence in our own settings and that's the focus that I'm going to look at today. If we listen, I suppose, to the media and to all of the narrative around sustainability within our food, we can get very focused on um, the, the consumption of meat and dairy and other various other food groups. And of course, that is important. Um, but food waste actually contributes a significant portion of our food emissions per person per day if we take take it as a whole. So this short, small infographic here from a um, the source food and climate change without hot air by Sarah Bridal is a nice one just to illustrate uh, how it fits in with our overall food consumption in terms of food emissions. I also just want to touch on the co other concepts of dietary pattern that mightn't automatically be considered waste, but can be wasteful if we put it together in terms of overall consumption. And the first is overbuying. So I suppose we are very much exposed to a marketplace that promotes overconsumption. Um, there's a huge amount of deals and offers when that we're faced with as a consumer in the supermarket. And overpurchasing is a huge issue because it later leads to food waste. So it's quite important that we take a step back as consumers and can sort of match our food purchasing with our dietary needs. That's not an easy stance to take. Uh, potentially 50% of the supermarket is, is lined with things that don't meet our nutritional needs um, or don't match them quite well. And I suppose that brings me on to low nutrient energy dense foods. So this is sometimes a phrase we use for foods that are very lacking, I suppose, in key essential vitamins and minerals for health, maybe low in protein, maybe um, not a, a nice, uh, like a healthy range of fats. And they would be typically high in fat, uh, sugars and salt. So uh, often called sometimes foods by dietitians or top shelf foods. So they're not required as part of a healthy diet, but of course they taste um, good and are very appealing. Um, and rather than them being treat foods, they are more likely to be everyday foods now. Um, so that can be seen as wasteful in the terms of our dietary patterns and also in terms of production. So I suppose I'm just throwing out some of these concepts to think about food waste as a whole in terms of our, our um, how we make up our diet. And the third concept I just wanted to bring in is acceptability of food and how we perceive that as consumers. So there has been some really big campaigns in Europe um, around, for example, I don't know if you've seen the ugly fruit and vegetable campaigns um, and supermarkets are under push producers under a lot of pressure to um, create the perfect uh, fruit and vegetables so that they they look good and are appealing to the consumer um but if we can change i suppose this this view um there could be a lot less food loss and waste before you know and and um more um acceptability of flaws in food um that can filter down to the home as well so um you know these pears typically so might someone look at them in their fruit bowl and say uh, they're destined for the compost or for the bin. Um, but if we can reorientate the way we look at these things and rescue them before they reach that and see them as a resource. So could these be sliced up and put into a smoothie or cooked and put into a dessert, cooked and frozen for later? Um, so how we rescue food and see our food that we've bought and spent money on as a resource before we think about the compost or the bin. Uh, some of the work we've done around food waste has looked at um, the types of foods that are wasted and the consequent nutrients that are lost. So thinking about what Nigel is, is looking at in terms of like rescuing nutrients and phytochemicals and important antioxidants from what would have otherwise been dumped. We can look at it similarly in food that we put into our own bins. Um, typically perishable foods are the most wasted. So fruits and vegetables, um, breads, uh, uh, some dairy foods and meats. 
And really what we're also putting into the bin is valuable energy, protein, um, important minerals like calcium, zinc and iron and a host of vitamins, which would be uh, an antioxidants, which would be contained in in the foods, particularly fruit and vegetables, because they tend to be the most wasted. What we don't waste so much is is more of the low energy, uh, uh, low nutrient energy dense foods. Um, they, they they're not as at risk in terms of, because I suppose they have a longer shelf life. As consumers as well, I think it's good just to look around and see um, what, what's available to us in terms of the guidance that we have and um, resources that are available to us. And I'm just raising this um, on this slide around food based dietary guidelines. So this in Ireland would be our food pyramid, uh, for example, and a lot of other countries across Europe and the world are integrating sustainability and health messaging and food waste messaging within their national dietary guidelines and these are just some um, if you're interested in looking them up further and I've just taken out the text that's that's relevant to food waste um, and I, in the near future in the next couple of years um, Ireland will be embarking on changes to the food-based dietary guidelines so it's just something to, to look out for and be aware of. So what can we do at a consumer level and sometimes we're all aware of these tips and suggestions but it's just being reminded of them or um, you know, maybe taking time out to do some of them. Uh, so planning and uh, observing our habits and practices can be really useful in reducing your overall food waste. Um, shopping lists and planning meals are very important. You could also, if you have time to do a household audit and see what's wasted the most um, and, you know, quantify what that might mean in terms of your food budget. Um, if you go and buy special offer deals in a supermarket, it's really important that we plan for that extra food because if it doesn't fit into our weekly meal plan or uh, how we, we eat on a typical basis, it can actually go to waste. So it may have saved us money at the, at the time or seemingly saved us money, but it may end up in the bin. And the other thing is special offer deals can help with things like batch cooking or, you know, meal prep and meal planning. Um, but Similarly, we should have really good planning around that. So have an easy to access list of what is in the freezer and plan to use it so they don't languish there for months and years at some times. Um, also, we all live really busy and, uh, you know, changeable lives. And if a planned meal doesn't happen, what can we do with that food so it doesn't sit in the fridge for the following week and eventually get thrown out? So can the food for example be immediately frozen or can it be stored better than it is right now could it be quickly cooked in another way for example like fish and you know turned into fish cakes another day or put in the freezer the other areas um, for our sort of food storage and cooking behaviours uh, when we get home and have done all the planning is to store food appropriately. On the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the really good resources that are available are in Ireland from the Environmental Protection Agency. And they have some brilliant sections on how to store food because it can significantly extend the shelf life of the food that you have bought. And there are particular, and they have found even in supermarkets, they've done initiatives where if they put the storage information uh, alongside the food, the perishable food that you're going to buy, it can really help consumers. Um, you might have heard of nose to tail eating when it comes to animal eating, um, but there's also root to shoot eating when it comes to vegetables and fruits. Um, you know, so don't discard or don't um, um, disregard, for example, the stalks on broccoli and cauliflower because they could chop, be chopped and boiled and they're very tender, just like with or steamed with your other vegetables um, or stir fried um, or put into soup. Um, and things like, you know, uh, kale stalks or um, celery leaves all can be used, for example, in stir fries or put into soups or put into um, casseroles. So think, have a look at the veg that you usually buy and think, is there any parts of this that I could be using? Nose to tail, of course, is using all of the animals. So if we are going to um, consume meats that we, you know, take care to use every piece. So it might be buying more cheaper and off cuts in the butchers. It might be if that you have a chicken that you may and you're roasting a chicken, you make sure you use every piece of it and perhaps make broth with the bones afterwards. Um, so just really valuing and, re and seeing as a resource all the food that we bring into our homes. 
Um, also think about ways of using old food that is safe to eat. So those uh, shriveled up pears that I sh showed you earlier. So just thinking ahead and reorientating ourselves. We mightn't have time to deal with it today, but do we have time to chop it up and stick it into the freezer? Um, do we have time uh, to make something quickly out of it um, and store it in a different way so it lasts a little bit longer? Um, a lot of people are used to cooking for a crowd, but and we this can lead to overcooking um, and portion sizes. So one important tip and we always uh, give this one is measure out pasta and rice before cooking to prepare just enough. And this can also help with portion size regulation at the table as well. Um, I think it's great to know from Nigel that the potential that our inedible food waste can have um, and that it can go places and we can recover our valuable nutrients from inedible food waste. And in your own scenario, is composting available to you? So is it available through maybe a brown bin, but it, could you set one up in your own home as well in your garden? So finally, then I'm going to mention the stop waste uh, food waste.ie, which is from the EPA. And Ireland are, have signed up to EU regulation in terms of um, targets to reduce food waste by half uh, by 2030. And um, this is an ambitious target and it involves all sectors of the food system. Um, but the EPA have public facing and, pu and really accessible information and a huge a lot more detail than I have presented here. But for example, they, their front page today has um, a piece on bread in it. So it goes through all of the areas around shopping, storage, use, um, reuse, all of that. And the same with storage for other uh, food items. And it also has a section on composting if you're thinking about setting up your own home compost as well. So thank you for listening. And uh, that's my email address. Um, and looking forward to taking any questions that you have.